Hello, my name is Harald Seib. In my day-to-day -day job, I work for IBM Storage, designing, implementing, and maintaining cloud storage architectures. But I'm here to present something with my head as IBM research part-time worker. So I work for Richlicon. Mark has talked about them. They not only do the very future stuff, but also some stuff that really you can take away today. And this is something I'm going to talk about. Okay. Actually, almost three years ago, probably uh, even more back in time, uh, we started exploring uh, new technologies as the backing storage for cloud. And as you know, hopefully, IBM is still into tape technology. It's not that. It's more than that because um, at that time we started, other companies also um, realized that data stored in the cloud, um, most of the data actually, is inactive. And uh, they started to care about uh, the real cost of the backing storage. And as you can imagine, if you count uh, everything into uh, what's required to store your data, it's not only uh, the storage medium, it's also space and heating and energy consumption. And actually, with, the, with these regards, tape uh, really gets you a good story. I mean, I'm putting these values uh, six times cheaper. You find the, the research papers uh, around if you Google for that. But also the future, I've just talked to a colleague over here, that uh, in August last year we demonstrated that we could fit 20 times more on a single tape cartridge than we can store today. It's already demonstrated. So we really have a long roadmap out there over the next years uh, in constant improvement of the tape storage density and what could fit on a single cartridge. And that demonstration actually would end up into 330 terabytes at this size here. So smaller than a 3.5 inch uh, hard disk drive. Obviously, uh, tape technology comes with some downside as well. The availability of the data, I mean, the latency is quite high compared to hard disks. Um, it depends on your uh, SLAs. We can tweak around a bit with software. Probably in the future we can tweak around much. There's also research going on in uh, Richly Gun uh, regarding improving the algorithms to actually access and store the data. Uh, but overall, it really gives a good um, use case actually to do your archival in cloud-based storage uh, using tape backends and a highly available hard disk drive front end. And the solution that uh, I'm talking about over here is actually an object storage cluster. Primarily, we focused on OpenStack Swift as an open technology. And uh, underneath, we actually provide means to move data back and forth between hard disk drive and tape. And uh, we kind of expanded the uh, API on top to actually facilitate uh, these movals uh, underneath. So let's uh, look into that project. The, the overall encompassing project is called Ice Tier, like cold storage. And uh, the more concrete stuff that we actually published as open source is called Swift HLM. HLM like high latency media. So we're not only focusing on tape. Uh, in general, this technology could also be exploited um, with other media. And the main goal is actually to um, overcome uh, and to con give you more control over this backend media. So there are already highly um, um, HSM solution, hierarchical storage management solutions out there. But uh, usually because they operate on a file system level, and the file system actually doesn't come with operations that deal with kind of movable between different uh, tiers, it's, it's hard actually to control these operations. And we thought that the evolving object interfaces 
uh, using HTTP as a transport mechanism are really well suited to actually implement this, to facilitate this, to realize this. So what we did is we expanded, so to speak, OpenStack Swift with an interface to deal with um, high latency media. So now users and applications can actually control the movement between um, disk and tape storage. In another kind of part of the overall project, we also researched potential data collocation uh, to more like improve the data access performance and the data storage performance. And at the end, um, you get a very well shaped integration of tape into your existing um, cloud storage environment if you're using object storage. And obviously, some things might seem familiar to you if one of you ever has used uh, Amazon Web Services with Glacier or other vendors that also provide some notion of uh, cold storage in the cloud and moval or transferal of data between hotter and colder storage tiers. Uh, but actually, so far, there is no solution available that you can build on your very own premises. And this is actually something we uh, hope to achieve with this project. As I said, we also focused on tape optimized uh, operations. Um, and uh, obviously, with the target to integrate our existing IBM take, uh, tape and software defined storage um, technologies into that. And we ended up with such an architecture that we actually put a custom middleware that is open source on top of Spectrum Scale with Object that is essentially OpenStack Swift uh, backed. And we have some um, yeah, backend specific uh, plugin as well uh, that can tie into existing solutions that already do hierarchical storage management like uh, Spectrum Project for space management or Spectrum Archive. And we have, on a research level, this is not really kind of full features, fully supported product yet. On a research level, we have demonstrated uh, this, and we also provide every piece in here to you. We have written a red book um, uh, so that you can also build these solutions today. Let's go back a bit. I mean, DK has uh, very quickly uh, touched OpenStack Swift, uh, how it looks like. Uh, I'm kind of um, repeating that a bit. Uh, so you have your application talking uh, HTTP using put and get operations to access your data. And usually you have a load balancer because you have a kind of a farm of proxy service in front of that that actually process the request. Then these proxy services actually use uh, a so-called ring uh, to actually determine the underlying storage nodes and then actually spread out data across these uh, backing storage nodes, having in mind that the data should be distributed well uh, to actually prevent uh, then when some zones in here go down or get fire or something like that, uh, that uh, at least one replica or fragments of the data are accessible to other zones and regions. This distribution mechanism, that's actually the essence why I show this to you, obviously doesn't really play well with the uh, notion of having tape underneath where actually your goal might be to have data collocated on ideally a single tape, for example, for a given project. So these uh, things are areas of our research as well. Uh, but for the very beginning, we mostly focused on uh, the, the front end over here. But actually, yeah, all the mechanisms that are available through OpenStack Swift over here, like this replication that I mentioned, also the erasure coding that lets you get a better economics on the data using uh, kind of erasure coding algorithms rather than 
trip, uh, triple replication, for example. These are also things that we want to leverage with our project. So we try trying to solve some issues with tape and then again leveraging things that are around uh, already. So we came up with uh, several sub-projects. One is to extend the ABI to actually on this top level here provide you operations that allow you to shift things around. Migration means moving to tape, recalling the other way around. You can query the status, where are my objects? Are they on tape? Are they on disk? And uh, how do my requests look like? Because obviously you want to do things asynchronously, um, especially when moving data to tape and back. Uh, and then we have to take care about some um, assumptions here in OpenStack Swift, for example. It was designed with uh, disk in mind, so there are kind of intrinsic timeouts throughout all these layers over here that don't really play well with tape. Uh, so we had to take care about uh, that as well. And uh, obviously, uh, we want to be cost efficient with the regards to using the drive. So we, we need some kind of disk cache in front uh, before then moving data back uh, or forth to tape. Uh, there in, in Swift, there's also a notion of the so-called auditor service uh, that does uh, periodic health, health checks, check summing on the underlying data. Uh, that, uh, in combination with tape, uh, in the way it's implemented today, would, ca would cause actually data to be retrieved back all the time from tape, which is something we don't want. So we need to take care of this auditor as well. We do have some design of how to kind of ideally um, handle this with tape, but uh, so far we turned off the auditor for our existing solutions. And then again, as I said, uh, the object distribution, uh, we have actually written some patents about that, uh, how this could be facilitated. Um, so uh, there are ways actually to modify these hashing algorithms over here so that data still gets distributed, but in a manner that it can be controlled and data doesn't get too distant uh, spread, for example, across a potential tape uh, libraries underneath here or zones within tape libraries. <clears throat> and as I said, we, we still want to reuse these uh, kind of um, mechanisms that um, ensure your data safety, that uh, data gets preserved um, with OpenStack Swift. I put in this paper over here because there are a kind of um, solutions within OpenStack Swift, especially the so-called ring-to-ring tiering that are coming up, and we want to ensure that we can comply with that because uh, it's complementary to what we do. Uh, so we are actually kind of moving data down to the tape uh, within a so-called uh, ring. Uh, a ring can be associated to containers, which is like folders in your file system. Uh, so when you instantiate a container, you could potentially say this is a tape container and then data gets uh, migrated to tape over there. And then you could have containers uh, marked for disk. And with this ring to ring tiering, you actually could achieve a solution, an architecture where you can uh, actually do the migration by doing this horizontal, I would call it, migration. Uh, using the ring-to-ring -ring tiering. So you potentially can convert an existing container from a disk container into a tape container and move the data around this way. This is especially when you want to separate your tape kind of infrastructure from your disk-based infrastructure, or you want to set aside a tape infrastructure next to your existing uh, disk infrastructure. Then potentially you want to use these uh, mechanisms. Let's have a look on the, the architecture, how we uh, designed uh, the software so far. We have a so-called middleware that hooks into the proxy node uh, software. Um, we expose the enhanced API. We have a separate namespace. This come up, uh, came up in long discussions over many OpenStack summits I and my colleagues uh, participated in. 
Um, so we use a separate namespace to not kind of intermix things with uh, the data path on OpenStack Swift. Um, we then uh, implemented a so-called dispatcher to allow asynchronous uh, request processing. We are following other dispatcher um, patterns that are in Swift, for example, for object expiration. So we are kind of reusing uh, concepts over there and we are converging with uh, upcoming um, thing, um, with upcoming developments to improve this backend infrastructure, which are still uh, under implementation. Uh, so we can, during migration and recall, we, we put requests into that queue and then the obvious tape um, operations that take quite some time get processed asynchronously by this dispatcher. Uh, we have a so-called uh, Swift HLM handler. It's another component that is invoked by a dispatcher and then actually feeds data um, and the requests into the so-called backend specific connector module. Uh, that connector module is independent of what we call Swift HLM. So the upper part we have as uh, open source software. The other part uh, down here so far we provide as free software. So we uh, ship uh, the extension uh, with uh, Spectrum Archive and for Spectrum Protect uh, we have a free download on, on the internet. There are others. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about this in a second. And yeah, it's not part of the packaging. If you look at the extended API, we have uh, this new um, namespace over here called HLM. Uh, everything else is quite similar to existing um, OpenStack Swift requests. And we have some new verbs in here like action could be migrate or recall. So you point to this object within an account or tenant or project, a given container, this object, over here you're going to migrate or recall. We comply in terms of error code with the best practices that are around for OpenStack Swift. And uh, this is the so-called request call that gives you a listing of ongoing uh, requests in the request queue. You've talked about task scheduler and task queues. This is quite similar to that. And then finally, we have a status operation where you can um, query if data is on disk or on tape. So you will get a JSON encoded listing of the objects and if they are on tape, on disk, or both on disk on, and on tape. So let's have a look at where we are at with this project. Uh, as I said, we're working very closely with the OpenStack community. Uh, we got the status as so-called official Swift associated project. So this code is not implemented in OpenStack Swift, but very close to. Uh, we currently provide it uh, as open source uh, through an IBM research GitHub. And uh, a very recent development uh, that was actually implemented by me is um, using memcached. I, I think DK talked about that. Uh, to significantly improve the status request because if you do a status request, you have to go uh, back to the at least the file system and then query uh, inodes uh, information to retrieve your status. If it's on disk or on tape, this could uh, take some time. And uh, we improved that by caching the information uh, in memory using D, the distributed uh, uh, memory caching algorithm. Uh, we not only worked with this pre-existing OpenStack Swift community, but we built a smaller community of supporters as well. Um, so I'm constantly in communication with uh, companies like BDT from Germany. It's a smaller company doing tape libraries. Actually, we are OEMing some of their libraries as IBM branded ones. Uh, of obviously, the, the big um, OpenStack supporters uh, from Reddit and SUSE. Uh, but also some uh, very smart guys from, from NTT from J Japan, a telco company, uh, and NTT Data, a cloud uh, provider. And uh, Fujitsu is uh, actually implementing Swift HLM for their optical storage, but more recently also for their tape solutions. They also OEM from BDT. It's quite nicely interlocked. 
Panasonic uh, was interested for their uh, optical storage and one of these hidden champions from China, I've never heard before, but quite a big company producing a full range of tape libraries, just a link to the huge Chinese market. Uh, they are also implementing that stuff. And last but not least, I think I, I mentioned that uh, we are integrating into IBM uh, products and we've published this red book to actually guide you to setting up this if you like to combine this with Spectrum Protect or Spectrum Archive. And this is a uh, kind of almost like announcement. Uh, this is another open source project that we are just about to um, announced we got this clearance uh, from the IBM processes so far, so it should turn out uh, in the next days. Uh, we call it LTFS da data management, and in opposite to what I've talked from an IBM perspective so far, uh, this is targeting open file systems. So potentially this uh, software stack could run on any file system that you pick. Um, so far, we focused on XFS, obviously, because that's the one uh, used in OpenStack Swift. And uh, we are implementing uh, all these operations that I talked about uh, in this kind of solution. Uh, also, some operational help tools uh, we provide in there. And uh, we actually do it as an overlay file system. So we are leveraging, um, actually, Fuse to do that file system in user space. And this is how the stack looks like. It might look familiar. So, and actually the goal is uh, to present a fully, uh, almost fully open source solution because this one here is still not open source. There are parts thereof, but it's an almost fully open source, complete tape-based cloud archive stack. And we are doing that to pay, push these use cases, not only as IBM, but also in a very tight cooperation with the LTO consumption. So other companies like HP and Quantum are supporting this kind of development. And as I said, this should be going public uh, within the next days, hopefully not weeks. Uh, so quick outlook, what we are working on these days, uh, we are heavily investigating in also supporting the S3 API on top of OpenStack Swift, because we have quite some clients uh, that prefer or also use the S3 protocol. By the way, um, S3 protocol users in here versus Swift users. Yeah, yeah, so on par. Yeah. This uh, resembles what I experienced so far. Uh, so there's this so-called uh, S3 lifecycle management API. We are investigating if we could leverage this existing API rather than creating something on top of that. Um, in this implementation, that's today Swift 3, and it's going to be S3 API because uh, the S3 extensions to Swift are about to be remerged into the mainline Swift code under the name of S3 API. And this is what we are uh, focusing on. Um, yeah, as I said, um, oh, no, I didn't uh, mention that. Uh, we are also moving our Swift HLM project to the open, uh, open stack GitHub. So rather than um, github.com slash IBM, whatever, uh, it's going to github.com slash open stack. That opens us uh, the door to more having better automated tests especially tests uh, written for Swift um, that we could also leverage uh, with our project to ensure that uh, things don't break when somebody in OpenStack uh, Swift does some modifications. And uh, some of the guys that I mentioned before that are also programming over here, they don't really want to contribute to the IBM GitHub. That's more a political thing. Um, we are also looking into um, kind of better tying into existing OpenStack Swift uh, features like large object support. It's working right now, but it could be better. Um, actually, some colleagues over here has asked, have asked us about ACL support, so limiting access to our kind of uh, additional API, which we think uh, pretty much makes sense. And uh, we also, uh, for 
similar reasons, we are looking into tying into the Swift versioning, so you do that you can have multiple versions, but probably some older versions get migrated, new ones uh, stay on disk. And last but not least, uh, we could uh, have some memcache footprint op optimizations. So as previous speakers have said, uh, if somebody is interested in that and likes to pick up our code, you're very welcome to join our small community. Otherwise, we will try to do these things with our resources. And uh, obviously, uh, an ongoing task is always be concurrent with Swift releases, which we are pretty we're good at at the moment. And to conclude, because I already got the sign, I've got a live demo. Um, this is the uh, setup uh, that I'm going to show. We have a uh, multiple node uh, OpenStack Swift cluster with it's actually a single tape library underneath uh, where all the servers can access uh, the tape content under here. And on the net end user laptop, we are leveraging uh, the so called um, Django Swift browser. It's a Python uh, web front end. And we a little bit extended that. You see over here, you can see that objects are on disk or uh, on tape. And um, we, under the operations that you can do over here, we've tied in our API extensions so that you can use this as a front end to actually move data. So I'm going to log in uh, to the machine over here. Uh, on the left, you see a folder which is empty, empty currently. Uh, on the right, you see this Swift browser over here. Uh, we have two containers. Uh, one container, uh, all objects are already on tape. So no on disk, 10 megabyte on tape. The other one is actually uh, two objects that still stay on disk. So let's uh, pick some object over here from the documents folder. We are going to use this and upload it as a new file. To container one, there we go. We use this add plus sign to upload the file. Once uploaded, it should be marked as not archived, so staying on disk. We go back to the container view and now use these uh, files that are on disk, the objects, and uh, now do the important operation migrate container. So we are invoking this uh, special API request over here. As it's asynchronous, it's not going to be executed and your browser doesn't keep spinning, so it just gives you a notification that it's uh, accepted. We haven't really implemented this uh, requests queue uh, thing yet into this browser, so we need to poll for the status uh, so far, but after a um, short period of time, you will see that uh, the objects are archived. Actually, I'm now uh, going to this other container. I clicked on the object to download it, and this is another functionality that we implemented. If you have archived it, you can't really retrieve it. It will get blocked. This avoids uh, these so-called recall storms that you get if anybody could retrieve it instantly from tape, then the tape would get crazy because uh, potentially multiple cartridges uh, or many, many cartridges need to get loaded. So you, in order to get to the data, you need to do the recall request, which I just did over here, which is again asynchronously gets put into the queue, things get sorted out nicely in the background, and once the data is back, uh, like it's over here, uh, then you can download and save the file uh, to the disk. So I think this concludes uh, my talk. Uh, if there are any questions, please, now or later, I'm still here for the rest of the day. If not, then thank you very much.